In video number 37 I proposed a classification for trackside sensors. We saw that an important criterion is whether the sensor measures a train passing a sensor, which I called add point, or the sensor detects a train sitting in an area, which I labeled as in area. In this video I am going to look into available in area sensors. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So get on board, the train is leaving the station. Just a quick announcement before I get started. I cleaned up my lab this week and came across some prototype boards for the blue box hardware introduced in video number 16. As I have no use for them, I put them up for sale. I have four of them available right away and another four in a few weeks as I'm waiting for some components. If you are interested, you can find more information about how to get one on the IOTT webpage. The link is in the description below. But now, back to the topic of this video. The standard way to build an in-area sensor is using current detection. Pretty much every DCC manufacturer has some sort of block detector module based on it. And this is how it works, shown at the example of the Digitrax BDL168. One rail of the track is cut into individual sections, which are electrically isolated from each other. The feeder wire for each section is then run through an individual current sensor. As soon as a small current is drawn in the block, for example when a locomotive enters the area, the sensor reports the area as occupied. And if there is no current flowing, the block is considered to be free. This is, by the way, very similar to what is done in real railroads where we also find isolated rail sections with a battery connected to it. When the axle of a locomotive or car bridges between the two rails, the circuit is closed and the relay is activated to set the signal that leads up to the block to a halt. Simple and effective. On model railroads there is one problem though. The rails are used to power the train and therefore the two ends of the axles are electrically isolated. So current detection only works for vehicles that have an onboard power pickup and current consumption, for example a decoder, a motor or some lights. To make regular cars detectable, a current sink needs to be introduced, usually in the form of a 10K resistor glued to the axle and connected to both wheels. This works reliably, but keep in mind that each detectable axle now adds a few milliamps to the total current consumption of a train. If you have lots and lots of cars, this somewhat adds up. And there are other known problems with current sensors to be aware of. If there is a power failure, there is no current flowing which might result in a wrong reporting of a free block. The same is true for a bad contact between wheel and rail. Here are just a few examples of commercial offerings for current sensing block detectors. And by looking at them, we see two main differences between the offerings that you might want to look at when making a buying decision. Here is the NCE solution. It consists of a sensor element, the NCE block detector BD20. Up to 14 of them can be connected to an auxiliary interface unit AIU01, which is needed to communicate the block statuses to the NCE CAP bus. The LED system uses basically the same concept. The LR101 is the interface module and up to 8 sensor elements LB101 can be connected to it. In addition, Lens provides a voltage detector LB050, which detects a loss of track power and prevents the block inputs from reporting the block as free if there is no power. Digitrax also offers a sensor-only module, the BD4, which can be connected to their switch decoder 
to add four block detector inputs. This is basically the same approach like NCE and LENS, but then they also offer the BDL-168 and the BXP-88, which integrate sensors and interface module into one single unit. The BDL-168 offers 16 section outputs, the BXP-88 has 8 of them and they are also have integrated track power monitoring. If the track power goes off, all blocks automatically are reported as occupied. So the first conceptual difference is integrated versus individual devices for sensors and interface module. Individual elements give you flexibility for placement close to the measured track section, but come at the cost of additional wires that need to be connected and potentially come loose over time. Another part of the flexibility is that you can use sensor modules from another brand. As long as the sensor of choice has an output that switches between ground and supply voltage, connecting it to the interface module should work without problems. The second difference, in my opinion, is more important and concerns the sensor itself. As you see from the pictures, NCE is using current transformers as sensor element, while LENS and Digitrax are using diodes. What's the difference and does it matter? In the case of the NCE BD20, the feeder wire passes the hole of a toroidal transformer and current flow induces a voltage in the secondary winding. This small voltage is then amplified and filtered and used to detect the current flow on the primary side. In the case of Digitrax and LENS, the feeder current flows through two anti-parallel diodes which results in a voltage drop of 0.5 to 0.7 volts depending on the selected diode. This voltage drop is then measured by a comparator to determine whether a current is flowing or not. The advantage of the transformer solution is that there is no voltage reduction caused by the sensor. Another advantage is complete galvanic separation of track power and electronic circuits. The main disadvantage on the other hand is that the induced voltage is proportional to the amount of the current flow, so there might be a sensitivity problem for very low currents. This is certainly the strength of a diode based sensor. Even very small currents, like when you bridge both rails with a finger, get reliably detected. But then of course this may become a disadvantage when using the detector in a garden railroad and there is some moisture on the track, which may lead to false positives. So what is the better solution? Again, it depends on the application. Personally, I favor diode-based sensors, but as you can see, you can make the argument for both. Technically, there is a third measuring principle that could be used, and that is a Hall effect sensor. Similar to the toroid transformer, the sensor signal is proportional to the current flow. However, the sensitivity is relatively low, only about 100 millivolts per amp. I have some of those sensors on order and will test them once they are here. If it works, I most likely will do a video about it. Stay tuned, subscribe to the IOTT channel and click the bell icon so that you don't miss that. In summary, current based block detectors are relatively reliable, easy to install and not too expensive in manufacturing. And for sure, they are the most prototype like sensor type available. Therefore, it is no surprise that they are also the most common sensor found on model railroad layouts and every major manufacturer makes them part of their layout control solution. But there is more. See, block detection is good enough for signaling as long as there is an intelligent engineer on board or at the throttle for that matter who exactly knows when and how quickly to slow down the train so that it comes to a halt right in front of the next signal. If we want to do the same with a computer as part of layout automation, a simple occupied non-occupied block detection is not sufficient. The program also needs to know who is approaching the signal. This is where train identification comes in, which I will cover in the next video. So that's it for today. 
If you find this video useful or at least interesting, please click the like button below, as it helps to promote this video and the entire IOTT channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time.